morning here in Asia and uh, good morning, uh, good evening to those who are joining us uh, from the United States and other parts of the world. Um, I'm Alfred Shipke and the director of the uh, East Asian Institute here at the National University of Singapore. Um, today, we're very honored uh, to have uh, Professor Jessica Chen Weiss uh, deliver the John uh, C.H. Wong lecture here at the uh, East Asian Institute. Um, our honored speaker is Professor for China and uh, Asia Pacific Studies uh, in the Government Department at Cornell University. Uh, she is a senior fellow at the Asian Society Policy Institute Center for China Analysis. Uh, she also served as senior advisor at the U.S. State Department's uh, Secretary's Policy Planning Staff on um, a Council of Foreign Relations Fellowship. Uh, Professor Weiss is the author of many peer-reviewed uh, journal articles and books. Uh, and uh, reflecting uh, her commentaries. Uh, she was also profiled uh, by The New Yorker uh, and named one of uh, Prospect Magazine's uh, top thinkers for 2024. Uh, she was previously an assistant professor at Yale University and received her PhD from the University of California in San Diego. Um, professor uh, Weiss's lecture uh, will focus on uh, China's ambition uh, and the future of international order uh, under the slogans of a China dream and a shared future for humankind put forward by uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, Professor Weiss will uh, take a look at internal tensions, debates, and interests that compete to shape China's approach to the world. Uh, through the lens of domestic politics, nationalism, and regime insecurity in China, Professor Weiss will examine the evolving and contested landscape of what China wants. The talk will conclude with reflections on policy, prospects for peaceful coexistence, uh, and the future of international order. Uh, Professor uh, Weiss, we're very much looking forward uh, to your lecture, um, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you to have me here and, and to be joined by so many of you here today. I want to talk to you a little bit about my research, which is uh, on the role of domestic politics uh, in Chinese foreign policy and the future of the international order. This book uh, is under advanced contract uh, with Oxford University Press and draws upon several recent uh, articles that I've published as well. So there's an increasingly you know, prevalent view that the United States and China are in the foothills of a new Cold War or some, what some call an extreme competition uh, to win the 21st century. And in this view, uh, China is a revisionist that seeks to displace the United States as the preeminent global power and to upend the so-called rules-based uh, international order. And I would say that this view has largely eclipsed prior optimism that an open and rules-based system uh, could peacefully integrate China uh, as a stakeholder into existing norms and institutions. In this prior view, it has been China's failure really to contribute enough to global governance to sometimes free ride uh, on the many public goods that the United States and others have provided. Um, and uh, that that issue that China's shirking or free riding uh, has posed a greater challenge uh, than its revisionism. But what's missing from all of these views, I think, is the enormous variation we have seen uh, in China's behavior uh, across issue areas, that these uh, catchphrases, whether revisionist or stakeholder or free rider, can't really uh, capture. Because in some cases, China has sought to reform the system to advance its interests, such as seeking to increase its voting share in the International Monetary Fund, while in other cases, China has sought to advance its interests outside of US-led institutions, such as the Belt and Road Initiative or the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. In other cases, it has all out rejected the standing of the International Court of Arbitration on the South China Sea, but it has also in other areas uh, pertaining to sovereignty claims styled itself as a conservative defender uh, of the norm of sovereignty uh, as enshrined in the UN Charter. And we've seen on climate change uh, a, a, a abrupt shift um, in China's stance from obstructionism 
uh, to seeking to play a greater leading role uh, in that space uh, over the course of several years. And so if all of this variation exists, depending well, on the issue area, but also changing over time, then perhaps as I started out this uh, presentation with, perhaps China is better described as a disgruntled uh, stakeholder. And an important article by Harvard researcher and professor Ian Johnston, um, he has laid out some of this variation. Of course, it's from a few years ago, but nonetheless, I think it's illustrative to see not only uh, that there are areas where China supports as well as opposes, but there are also areas where the United States supports and opposes, suggesting that there is not a single international order, but many different domains that need to be disaggregated to understand the contours of not only what China supports, but uh, where the United States and China might actually have some shared and overlapping interests. This is an important step, I think, to unpacking uh, the global order, but it Johnston in his article has stopped short of explaining uh, why different issue areas end up in different um, parts of this uh, two by two quadrant. It's also a static snapshot, um, which doesn't capture really the evolution interaction uh, between the US and Chinese positions. And so a key question that my work seeks to address is where is this variation coming from and, and where is it going? And so this project looks at how domestic politics affects China's foreign policy preferences and its behavior across different issue areas. And importantly, how international pressure and politics and the uh, incentives created by the international environment, how they in turn shape uh, the domestic landscape uh, inside China. So my starting premise is that the Chinese Communist Party leadership under Xi Jinping at present, is first and foremost concerned with surviving domestically as the uncontested governing party uh, of China. The Chinese Communist Party has been very afraid of peaceful evolution and democratic contagion in a world where most communist parties um, have collapsed. The Chinese Communist Party is very afraid of going the way of the others. And so their overarching goal is regime survival. And that requires making the world safer for autocracy, which is not necessarily exclusive of democracy, but it, it certainly means pushing back against the idea that the only legitimate form of governance uh, is, is the liberal democracy. Now, survival for the Chinese Communist Party entails more than just uh, relying on the tools of repression, although they have a formidable repressive apparatus. It is also about performance. It's about persuasion and co-optation providing not just bread, but also in some cases circuses uh, to bolster domestic support. And so I argue that two dimensions of an issue, centrality and contestation shape the domestic politics of a given issue. And it's variation along these two different dimensions that shapes China's approach to uh, these issue areas, both domestically and internationally. Since the late 1970s, the Chinese Communist leadership has relied on three central pillars, nationalism, stability, and economic development to justify its continued rule. Sometimes this is referred to as sovereignty, security, and development, or in Chinese, Zhuxian, Anxian, Hefajian. And on issues that are linked to these central pillars, like Taiwan, Hong Kong, other territorial disputes, the Chinese Communist Party has been hyperactive in making demands and insisting on its preferences, even when these have led to international criticism and blowback, such as when China, uh, the Chinese government rejected uh, the ruling of the arbitral uh, panel when it invalidated China's claims in the South China Sea. But on other issues which are less central, like international peacekeeping and many issues before the United Nations, the Chinese Communist Party has been much more flexible in its uh, approach. So for example, under international pressure, the Chinese-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank adopted rhetoric about the environmental and social consequences of its policies that are quite similar to those of uh, Western-led uh, uh, development banks. And uh, even recently, the International Monetary Fund uh, applauded China's announcement of a debt sustainability framework uh, in response to criticism of the Belt and Road Initiative. And so the more central uh, an issue is, the more pressure the government faces domestically to perform. It means that 
it's harder for the government to go against uh, popular or elite expectations. Repression is possible, but it becomes costlier and more likely to backfire, which makes it harder for the government to make concessions on central issues um, without uh, potentially suffering a domestic uh, backlash. So as a result, international issues, international pressure on central issues are more likely to provoke uh, rather than deter uh, Chinese uh, tough behavior um, because it's under such pressure to be seen as defending uh, its so-called core interests. Now, what that means for the prospects for compromise or conflict really, uh, of course, depends on uh, the prevailing international uh, environment, because a government that's more willing to go it alone um, may have more leverage, um, but that, of course, depends on the willingness of other actors in the area to accommodate or make concessions uh, to, the, to those domestic imperatives. So it could create leverage, but it could also uh, create deadlock, as uh, Scott Kastner, Margaret Pearson, and Chad Rector uh, have pointed out in their book on China and global governance. But importantly, these central pillars, nationalism, growth, and stability, are often in tension with one another. And managing these domestic pressures, or what you might call contradictions, creates a lot of risks and trade-offs for the government to manage. It also means that an issue that touches on one central pillar of regime support doesn't necessarily mean that the government can't compromise or make concessions. For example, uh, in his research, Taylor Frable has shown that the Chinese Communist Party leadership has historically been willing to make uh, territorial compromises when uh, it has seen a need to shore up domestic security and control over minority populations, making compromises with neighboring states in order to serve those uh, domestic stability purposes. Now that's then, this is now, nonetheless, I think it's important to know that there are cases uh, where compromises have been made, uh, even on a central issue like territorial disputes. Climate change and China's chi changing stance on carbon emissions is, I think, another area uh, where an international issue touches on two different pillars, both economic growth, but also public stability. Because initially, the Chinese Communist Party's response to international efforts to limit carbon emissions was seen as threatening to domestic economic growth and the government acted as a spoiler at Copenhagen. But once the scale of the catastrophe was revealed and created all sorts of mass and elite outrage within China uh, at the extent of the air apocalypse and these incredible pollution, the Chinese government shifted strategies, investing heavily in international efforts uh, to limit carbon emissions and go green at home. As public health and stability uh, came to the forefront, Xi Jinping explicitly noted that, quote, our environmental problems have reached such severe levels, the strictest measures are required. If not handled well, they most often easily incite mass incidents, which in the Chinese phrasing is code for protests. Another example of these tensions between pillars is the trade-off the Communist Party faces in managing nationalist mobilization, which is the subject of my first book, where grassroots nationalism and outcry can help show resolve and demonstrate that China too faces domestic constraints and won't be pushed around. On the other hand, this can come at a cost to domestic stability. And it's this domestic dilemma that the international context has helped uh, to adjudicate, as I argued, in powerful patriots. Another important feature of the argument is that authoritarian regimes, even highly centralized ones that are increasingly personalistic, like the current one uh, in China, are still not monolithic. There's all sorts of ideas, interests, conflicting uh, geographic, economic, institutional differences, as well as different narratives, priorities, and values that seethe beneath the surface. There are a lot of different ways to think about contestation inside China, even in the absence of um, you know, elections or even really clear uh, factional contestation. You can still have uh, these competing traditions uh, and emphases and priorities uh, vying for influence uh, over um, a key decision, for example. And this is true even in the, uh, what you might call ideological realm, um, where 
uh, leading scholar Yan Shitong has written that Marxism is the official ideology of the Chinese Communist Party, but it has had limited uh, influence on actual uh, foreign policy. And so a lot of my research in this book, but then also prior, I have up here a, a slide from a paper that I wrote with uh, Jeremy Wallace, um, a colleague and my partner, on the geographic distribution of anti-Japanese protests. Uh, this is uh, dating to the 2012 uh, protests uh, during a dispute with Japan over the islands in, in the East China Sea, where you have a great deal of variation in where and, and when uh, these protests uh, were allowed. So a lot of interesting subnational variation to keep in mind as well. And we can't really understand uh, China's response to COVID-19 without reference to these center local divisions. Because at the central government, known earlier of this extent of human to human transmission, it likely would have acted sooner uh, to contain the outbreak. But local government efforts to quash potential panic and disruption on the eve of important uh, political meetings made it harder for the central level officials to grasp the scale of the emergency. And by then it was too late. I think the COVID-19 uh, pandemic also revealed trade-offs and the degree of emphasis amongst these uh, three pillars, with this really stability first. The Chinese Communist Party allowed the economy to contract for the first time in decades, and it wasn't until the outbreak was under control, at least at home, that the Chinese government moved uh, to restart uh, the economy. And then uh, when protests broke out against the draconian uh, zero COVID restrictions, the government then ripped off the Band-Aid, right, returning to the standard practice of kind of quashing the protests, but addressing the underlying grievances, in this case, these uh, insufferable uh, restrictions on movement. So this domestic contestation uh, affects in significant ways how China behaves uh, on the international stage. The more contested an issue is domestically, the more likely we are to see difficulties with implementation and enforcement where you have often as if compliance uh, with international commitments. For example, in the environmental domain, you have local officials often resisting uh, central directives to shut down polluting firms with uh, economic development remaining quite important to cadre promotions. Chinese officials and industries have often sought to game the system and try to comply, but not really comply uh, with these uh, regulations and incentives. And the greater uh, this kind of heterogeneity of domestic preferences and uh, mobilized interest, the greater the likelihood that you're going to see policies uh, benefiting some domestic interests at the expense of others whose opposition might need to be diffused um, than with some, what you might call side payments. And so, uh, you know, for example, to pursue uh, the appreciation of the renminbi, uh, the Chinese uh, leadership had to placate uh, export-oriented industries with subsidies and other preferential policies, as research by uh, David Steinberg and Victor Xi has uh, shown. Similarly, research by uh, Yuan Yuan Ang indicates that uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has largely provided kind of an encompassing um, but vague slogan that has made it easy, quote, for domestic interest groups to use a national policy as a cover to pursue their own agenda. And of course, now that I've given you two dimensions, putting them together, look, contestation and centrality don't necessarily map neatly onto one another. Some highly central issues are characterized by low levels of apparent contestation like Taiwan, but other highly central issues are also uh, quite contested, um, ranging from uh, climate change to trade to exchange rates. Other issues are relatively uh, distant, I would say, from these central pillars uh, undergirding uh, the CCP's claim uh, to uh, performance legitimacy. Most issues uh, before the United Nations or uh, for example. But some of those low centrality issues still have uh, a high degree of heterogeneity where you have individual actors within China or interests uh, playing uh, an important ro role in uh, confounding implementation of certain agreements and commitments. So for example, Ian Johnston uh, again uh, noted that China had played an important role in the 2015 uh, nuclear deal with Iran helping to redesign a key reactor to reduce 
Iran's future plutonium output. At the same time, uh, it, China failed to halt the export of ballistic missile technology to Iran due to the well-connected interests of a particular arms exporter uh, within China. Now, stepping back from this, even this kind of two by two, I think depiction of issues really misses or underestimates the malleability of these dimensions as both the top leadership in the in the China as well as different constituencies within and below the government seek to shape the narrative and salience uh, surrounding a particular issue. So to take uh, an example, the Chinese government tried to uh, increase the centrality and decrease contestation or domestic dissent in order to demonstrate resolve over two uh, different issues, the Hong Kong uh, protests, as well as the US-China trade war. The Chinese media and government framed these issues uh, as part of a national struggle, uh, reminiscent of the Opium War, the Korean War, and other long-running disputes where China eventually uh, prevailed. In doing so, the government has uh, sought to build public support for uh, withstanding the costs of conflict and make it more difficult to compromise or offer international concessions, signaling its intent to stand firm against foreign pressure. But the government isn't the only one with agency here. There are subnational actors that may link their demands to a central pillar in order to increase the likelihood of policies or side payments that may benefit them or protect their, uh, their interests. So as different actors seek to kind of bid against each other for government attention, different actors may try to amplify the centrality of their interests uh, and make to, in hopes of making them more likely to succeed than those whose interests remain peripheral and parochial. So for example, uh, during negotiations over China's entry into the World Trade Organization, a whole different array of industries and ministries and provincial governments uh, lobbied for continued protection, some more successfully than others. For example, Margaret Pearson has shown that the telecommunications industry and its affiliated ministry, the Ministry uh, of Information Industries, succeeded uh, by linking demands for protection to worries about social unrest and the loss of Chinese sovereignty to foreign powers, rather than simply a desire to avoid uh, market competition. So you might be wondering if the government can control the narrative and subnational actors also are competing to cheerlead and appropriate the party line. How is any of this affecting Chinese foreign policy? What are the limits of an authoritarian government's ability to mold popular sentiment, creating potential audience costs or other pressures that they must weigh in setting policy? The core of my argument is that these domestic pressures are malleable constraints that investments in ideological frameworks and nationalism help set the parameters against which the government is judged. These parameters can be shifted slowly and over time, but there are costs and risks, also potential benefits uh, to doing so. And so what China wants is really a contested and moving target, but this framework can still help us identify the patterns that shape the domestic pressures the government faces in trying to navigate competing objectives at any given moment. So in chapters three and four of this book manuscript, I look at the role of regime insecurity and what it might look like, uh, so far at least, uh, for the Chinese Communist Party to pursue a world that is safer, at least, for autocracy. I'll preview that as well as a bit about nationalism and territorial disputes before returning them uh, with some thoughts for policy and implications for the future of international order. So most observers agree that the Chinese Communist Party has felt existentially threatened by the most liberal and intrusive aspects of the US-led international order. But there's little agreement on what this ideological insecurity has meant for Chinese foreign policy uh, its conduct as well as its ambitions. Some analysts have argued that the CCP's Leninist character fundamentally determines its global ambitions. They argue that beyond seeking survival, the CCP will rest at nothing less than dominance and a subversion of democratic capitalism. And these views place less emphasis on Xi Jinping or individual Chinese leaders than the nature of the CCP as a Leninist regime that is supposedly playing the long game to blunt 
American power and eventually replace the United States as the most powerful state in the world, not only materially, but also ideologically. A second line of reasoning reaches somewhat similar conclusions, but on the basis of Xi Jinping's beliefs rather than intrinsic features of Chinese Communist Party rule. As former Australian Prime Minister and current Ambassador to the United States, Kevin Brett has written, under Xi, ideology drives policy more often than the other way around. He is a true believer in Marxism-Leninism. His rise represents the return to the world stage of ideological man, end quote. And Kirk Campbell has similarly characterized ideology as, quote, at the core of what chi drives China today, end quote. But in contrast, a third school of thought argues that ideological differences between China and the West have been misconstrued or exaggerated in importance. Now, of course, some from the you know, camp of structural realism treat ideology as inconsequential next to material capabilities. But others take ideology more seriously, but argue that its content has been misspecified in this instance. So, for example, Yuan Yuan Ang has argued it's not autocracy, but the more liberal improvisational practices within China's state-directed system that have been responsible for China's success. And Ho Feng Hong has noted that ongoing tensions between the United States and China stem less from ideological differences than intercap what he calls intercapitalist competition. And so it's this set of perspectives, and I would venture most scholars of Chinese politics see much less of a coherent model for China to export, even though there are signs that this may be changing. And in this work, I build upon and extend this view in several ways. So first, what I argue is that the Chinese Communist Party seeks a less ideologically threatening international environment, but still has to balance this objective with other self-designated metrics of performance, including development and nationalism. So even where authoritarian regimes make common cause on the basis of regime insecurity and a shared desire to insulate themselves against liberal universalism, contending priorities can still exert a countervailing influence. For instance, China has limited, it, it had not fully uh, give thrown its support uh, behind Russia's war in Ukraine, despite Xi Jinping's close ties with Putin, in part, I think out of an interest in avoiding potentially crippling secondary sanctions that would jeopardize China's modernization and continued economic development. And so rather than a static cage, I argue that the use of ideology and ideological rhetoric in China is both contested and to some extent pliable. It's made up of multiple traditions and strands that have been woven together for the purpose of providing greater legitimacy than any single ideological tradition alone. As uh, a scholar here, Yeju Zhao notes that, you know, although these doctrines and slogans shouldn't be taken at face value, they should not be dismissed as completely empty. Even if its ideology is a quote, living lie, it sets the basic terms of the CCP's hegemony over Chinese society and serves as a symbolic resource for social contestation. So under Mao, for example, capitalists were persecuted as counter-revolutionaries, but under President Jiang Zemin, the Chinese Communist Party abandoned a key Marxist principle in 2001 by accepting private entrepreneurs into the party uh, as full members. And so in combining and recombining different strands of uh, different ideological traditions, the party has been both adaptive and reactive to perceived threats domestic and international. It doesn't mean that ideology is unimportant, but it does suggest that the party's actions and pronouncements don't reflect a static set of convictions. Because beneath the party's continued rhetorical emphasis on Marxism-Leninism, there's still continuing debate over what role China should play on the world, st on the world stage. As uh, the Chinese scholar Yao Yang has noted, even we don't believe uh, much of what we say. And in his effort to suggest that Confucianism is just as good as liberal thought, and the goal really isn't, in his view, to defeat liberalism, but instead to say that what we have can be as good as what you have. Similarly, uh, Jiang Shigong, a, a scholar, sometime apologist for Xi Jinping thought, has argued that socialism is not ossified dogma, but instead an open concept awaiting exploration and de uh, definition. And so these contending ideas and interests create trade-offs or contradictions, if you will, 
Even Xi Jinping's growing concentration of power doesn't provide an escape from the competing priorities and ideational traditions that he has embraced. And it's true that the CCP has always been preoccupied with potential threats to the regime, but the intensity of this concern has waxed and waned with the perceived threat of foreign-backed efforts at subversion, as you can see in this keyword, uh, this keyword chart uh, from People's Daily Articles, looking at fluctuation in the frequency of references to hostile forces, to uh, peaceful evolution, uh, color revolutions, and fears of Western efforts to uh, westernize and split China. And this variation is important because it suggests an ebb and a flow to the level of concern about foreign interference and ideological competition. And so the CCP has sought to secure one party rule in part by challenging ideas that Western style democracy and capitalism lie at the end of history. But there are different ways to pursue this objective. It's important to know. Some have suggested that the CCP would feel safer in a world where autocracy is on the rise and democracies are faltering. And so the CCP would be tempted to put its thumb on that scale. And similarly, some have suggested that under Xi, the CCP has embraced very preventive notions of regime security and that these efforts extend beyond China's borders in ways that require a more escalatory or offensive approach. But authoritarian regimes do have a menu of options to reduce the, their perceived threat of democratic contagion or threats of regime change. And efforts to reduce this ideological threat don't necessarily need to run through risky and potentially counterproductive efforts to change other countries' systems of governance. And so while the CCP might feel safer if the world were populated by more communist or formerly communist single party states, the CCP also, at least till now, seems to recognize that the costs and risks of trying to bring about such a world are greater than the benefits. As we saw under the Mao era, certainly efforts to export revolution came at great expense uh, to China's national interests. And a shared communist heritage has had little value uh, for reducing tensions, for example, between China and Vietnam. And so largely speaking, I think to advance the cause of national rejuvenation, so to speak, the CCP has pursued a much more ideologically agnostic approach to dealing with foreign leaders and political parties. Yes, the CCP has sought to bolster uh, friendly incumbents and to blunt more intrusive uh, strands of liberalism, but without seeking to topple Democrats or install autocrats or socialists. Its approach to development finance and assistance has provided an attractive alternative coming without the conditions attached to promoting good governance. And indeed, Chinese training programs may enhance the ability of authoritarian leaders to govern well, helping them hone their what you might call survival strategies. So ultimately, what I would say is that Chinese efforts may be helping to consolidate authoritarianism where it already exists, rather than promoting its further spread by subverting democracy. This is not a distinction without a difference in my view. China's activities are making autocracy more viable and to the extent that China succeeds in its own uh, efforts, domestically strengthening uh, the appeal of authoritarian governance. It's also true that the CCP's efforts to intimidate critics are having a corrosive effect on open thought and discussion in liberal democracies. But the strategic objective of the CCP's ambitions do not appear, at least so far, to hinge on defeating democracy or installing like-minded regimes around the world, implying that there's more room for, at least in principle, room for coexistence between autocracies and democracies, and a potential detente in the realm of ideas about how countries govern themselves. Now, some aspects of China's conduct have suggested an evolution, including the increased criticism of democracies and the promotion of the amplification of some disinformation that could undermine the healthy functioning of democratic elections. And similarly, the escalation of what the United States has called extraterritorial or transnational repression against critics of the Chinese government. It may not be intended to subvert democracy, but it's nonetheless corrosive to democratic freedoms. Some have therefore argued that the West 
quote, must go on offense to impose costs, to put the CCP on the defensive and to knock the party off balance, end quote. But if this ideological insecurity is interactive, as exacerbated by changes in the international environment, then these kinds of efforts to fight fire with fire might actually be more likely to provoke further escalation by triggering and exacerbating the fundamental regime and security that's at the root uh, of these efforts. So recognizing the interaction here is, in my view, crucial. Security dilemma dynamics can lead to mutual escalation even when actors believe they are acting defensively. Still, such a diagnosis and an approach allows for greater possibility of mutual de-escalation to reduce perceptions of existential threat and put bounds around these ideological differences. And there's more room for ideological coexistence uh, with a CCP that would settle for legitimacy in a world that's also populated by democracies compared to a CCP that feels existentially threatened by the persistence of democracy uh, anywhere in the world. Now, one of the reasons to be relatively calm, I think, about the prospects for mounting ideological competition is that unlike the Soviet Union, the CCP no longer espouses revolution externally anyway. There's a lot of self-revolution that's different. And this means that the CCP is more concerned with whether countries, say, in Africa or Latin America, defer to the one China principle than whether they are governed by authoritarian, democratic, socialist, or Marxist-Leninist principles. This could change, to be sure, but so far, the CCP's diplomacy and its rhetoric has been more heavily weighted toward nationalism than universalism, professing an interest in each country pursuing its own development path. Now, nationalism itself is also a contested and evolving force uh, within China, containing multiple and at times contradictory strands of thought. It's a constraint because nationalism provides contingent support. As one of the chief pillars of the Chinese Communist Party's claim to legitimacy, nationalism can bolster or threaten the regime and its legitimacy. But weak performance on issues that are central to the defense and advancement of the nation can also hollow out or undermine the CCP's claim to rule. And so in this way, nationalism can help shape the government's calculus, but doesn't actually tie its hands. At the same time, nationalism is a malleable constraint because it's not wholly exogenous or independent. Its landscape is selectively cultivated as well as pruned back by the state. And over time, state as gardener could cultivate or renovate or even extend the landscape, but it's hard work, particularly once a particular strand of nationalism and beliefs have grown extensive roots. As I documented in my first book, the government has been quite strategic in determining when to allow or repress nationalist mobilization. Now, recently, this kind of mobilization has largely been allowed to flourish online where efforts on social media and other online forums have been tolerated, drowning out, and in some cases, persecuting those who would criticize government policy or performance. But the government doesn't always choose to mobilize hawkish voices. In the past, it has devoted nearly equal effort to tamping down nationalist voices, seeking to preserve flexibility and manage risks of escalation. And interestingly, I think we can see in some of the recent uh, rhetoric and coverage of friendship between the American and Chinese peoples, for example, as a, another sign of a shift in that matches the government's change in diplomatic tactic to create space in uh, both in the domestic and international sphere for this, uh, this sort of recalibration uh, of Chinese diplomacy, one that favors greater stability and, and a, a, a kind of rapprochement, although nonetheless, <clears throat> it's it's a it's it's it's, a, it's pretty thin and, and also certainly backed um, by steely resolve, um, particularly over the issue uh, of Taiwan and uh, Chinese claims in the South China Sea. Now, surveys <clears throat> have shown that Chinese attitudes are generally uh, fairly hawkish, <clears throat> with a majority of respondents having endorsed greater reliance on military strength and supporting greater spending on national defense and certainly viewing uh, the U.S. military presence and reconnaissance operations in East Asia as threatened. But there's variation here too, with internet users tending to be more hawkish than ordinary citizens and elites also 
tending to be more hawkish. And so these sentiments may still affect the government's calculus, even if popular sentiment isn't a direct driver of Chinese foreign policy. And in survey experiments that I've done with co-authors, we found that the government is able to buy some wiggle room using bluster and tough rhetoric to bolster popular support, but still paying a cost if it doesn't take tough action. And in a series of papers, my co-authors and I looked at how Chinese citizens evaluated their government's performance in both real time, as well as in reaction to a variety of different scenarios, both hypothetical uh, as well as real. And so although we found that the Chinese government does face kind of blowback from making explicit threats and then failing to follow through, that kind of explicit backing down is quite rare and much more common is what we call bluster, this tough but vague talk that has helped the Chinese government appease nationalist demands while avoiding the use of force. So for example, when tensions escalated in the East China Sea in 2013, China employed quite fiery words and demanded that foreign aircraft identify themselves and comply with Chinese instructions when flying over the East China Sea instead of using force. And reminding Chinese citizens that their government had declared this ADIS improved public evaluations of the government's performance. But when we looked at the Chinese responses to a variety of perceived provocations, including uh, reminding them of the 2001 EP3 incident in which pilot uh, Wang Wei uh, disappeared and lost his life, we actually found a decrease in popular support, um, popular approval of the Chinese government's performance. And this has important implications because a conventional expectation is that the Chinese government can invoke foreign slights and humiliations to rally the public around the flag. But this research suggests that rally effects are conditional on what the government does rather than something that they can enjoy just reflexively. And that means that the government in China may be more limited in its ability to invoke these foreign provocations to build public support without also uh, stoking pressure for tough action. To look at real-time effects, we also found this in the context of the resumption of US freedom of navigation patrols in the South China Sea in 2015. In days following the patrols, we found in, again, a survey that was being, we conducted at the time, we found an increase in popular disapproval of the Chinese government, which issued vague warnings, but ultimately didn't use force to intercede or harass these US patrols, which had been uh, announced publicly. And so these results suggest that despite the Chinese government's bluster, it was unable to fully offset the costs of restraint in the face of these uh, foreign patrols. So while they were able to reduce public demands for tough military action, they still did not fully succeed. What this means then is that high profile, close in military operations may appear successful and that they don't lead to a near term uh, response, but in the long term, they may prove counterproductive by increasing uh, pressure on the Chinese government to take uh, actions short of force, particularly in the gray zone, uh, to increase the tempo of its uh, activities to showcase uh, their ability to stand tough against U.S. perceived provocations uh, before Chinese uh, domestic audiences. So turning now to the implications of this framework, what kinds of international pressure then are likely to get results and what are likely to backfire? So if an issue is central and uncontested, like territorial claims in the South China Sea, I think it's important that actors outside China beware of potentially counterproductive pressure, which could provoke rather than deter. To shift Chinese behavior on these issues, there will need to be, I think, countervailing but equally powerful central incentives for cooperation. One could also look toward detente, uh, coordinated but unilateral steps to set bounds around actions that each side takes so that no unilateral concessions um, are required. Now, if this issue has a lot more contestation, there's a lot more room to play powerful constituencies off one another, utilizing side payments uh, to get them to go along. I think issues that are much less central um, to the Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy are more likely uh, to, for multilateral pressure especially, to be effective, unless you have um, you know, issues with enforcement 
um, if you have a powerful domestic actor uh, ca either capturing policy or uh, ending up making it difficult to uh, see full compliance. In conclusion, as we consider the renegotiation of the future of the international order and amid China's rise, my argument is that we cannot simply deduce from first principles or historical analogies how China is likely to behave. You have to look at the domestic politics of Chinese preferences and constraints. With the Chinese Communist Party behaving strategically, investing in reshaping and rejecting international arrangements in areas that are central, um, and being more willing to free ride and defer to international practices or pressure on issues that are more peripheral, you have a China that is simultaneously a revisionist, a reformer, a free rider and defender, so perhaps disgruntled stakeholder, one that seeks a world that is safer for autocracy is a better catchphrase. Much of China's international behavior, I think, reflects the spillover effects, both positive and negative, of China's domestic investments and incentives. Some of those spillover effects can be positive, um, such as China's investments in renewable technologies, at least although that's a subject of a lot of contention now, has certainly made it more affordable, uh, at least, even to install a renewable technology at scale, uh, even if those have significant distributive effects on where those technologies are, are produced. At other times, I think China's domestic investments have had quite negative uh, externalities from the perspective of liberal democracies, such as its export of surveillance technology and demands that the NBA and other foreign businesses and celebrities engage in self-censorship uh, in order to operate in the Chinese market. But taking seriously this domestic contestation uh, within China means that Ch Beijing's intentions are really a moving target, one that is evolving with domestic as well as international circumstances. There may be a general direction set out or even targets for acquiring certain capabilities, but how and when uh, the Chinese leadership uses those capabilities and to what ends, that has not been said. Even China doesn't know quite where it is headed. So what does this mean then for the future of the international order? The PRC's preferences are only one input into this strategic renegotiation, if you will, of the rules-based international order. The United States and other powers also have a great deal of agency, small and large. On many central issues ranging from human rights to internet governance to trade, we're likely to see continued contestation and even confrontation. But on those issues where uh, both states have determined that their interests are in direct conflict, we're more likely to see kind of unilateral action and smaller coalitions of countries working together. But within the broader set of institutions that make up global governance, I think there is in principle room for a peaceful, if still competitive uh, coexistence. And so disaggregating the international order allows us to track where US interests and Chinese interests are aligned and where they are opposed. Ultimately, <clears throat> China's social purpose, domestically speaking, doesn't require the wholesale destruction or replacement of the existing order, even if it favors a much more conservative version, one that emphasizes, at least in principle, Westphalian notions of sovereignty and non-interference, the primacy of the state and development over individual political rights. But of course, there are aspects of, for example, the extraterritorial clause in the national security law, the intimidation of overseas Chinese and academic freedoms, that these all threaten the principle of non-interference. So if China and the United States and others want to preserve and defend a return to Westphalia, China too will have to curtail uh, some of its uh, inter transnational activities. Now, some have looked at China's growing influence and more assertive efforts to secure its so-called core interests and concluded that China is an existential threat. In my view, this is an exaggeration. The CCP does seek a world safer for autocracy, but in principle, this is also compatible with a world safe for democracy. We're not quite there yet, but it could be. So far, at least, China's ideological ambitions under the CCP have been more nationalistic than universalistic, even if its efforts uh, to intimidate and punish critics have gone global in scope. But even if the CCP's efforts uh, are not trying to remake other societies in its image, there still may be knock-on effects of its technological exports, its capacity building programs, and 
and normative defense of state sovereignty over individual political rights. Some may say, therefore, that the United States and other liberal democracies should kind of go on the offense um, rather than seeking to reduce the CCP's sense of the West as the existential danger. But I think this overstates the CCP's ideological appeal and could backfire by fueling an escalation of this spiral of insecurity. So ultimately, as I've written, the best response to an increasingly nationalistic and authoritarian China is to adopt an asymmetric approach, one that focuses on getting our own house in order and leading with an affirmative, inclusive vision of international order. Efforts to tackle shared challenges like climate change, development, energy, poverty, and health will have greater benefits than a head-on contest with China. And that does not mean giving up on deterrence or efforts to build resilience against coercion, but it does re recognizing that countering or outcompeting China cannot become an end unto itself. If our ultimate objective is the pursuit of peace, prosperity, and human progress, we do not need to knock each other out in order to win. Thanks so much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you very much for this very insightful, and I think also uh, timely um, uh, research and thoughts on uh, what China wants. Um, uh, again, um, what strikes me is that uh, your insights um, and views are extremely timely, given that the view of China outside of China, the narrative that exists gets simpler and simpler and basically goes to a black and white world. Uh, and I think what you're arguing is uh, that ultimately risks uh, confrontation. Um, if one better understands uh, that, um, you know, there is prospect for ideological coexistence, for example, uh, that's a very different starting point uh, than if um, a winner takes it all kind of uh, um, um, approach. Um, I also, I think uh, you highlighted very nicely um, that uh, the dynamics within uh, uh, China, both that some of the slogans um, um, are not as clearly defined and they change over time. Um, uh, so there's room for, for development and understanding which way they could go is very important. Um, and then also the regional differences and the incentive structures within uh, China that makes it very difficult to just impose one, one view, um, I think is, is, uh, is, is very, very uh, helpful. Um, I'm sure we have um, um, quite a bit of um, uh, questions. Question here from um, Bert Hoffman, which ah, he asks: yes. Can you reflect on the extent to what extent misperceptions uh, for by China's leadership, uh, mis or accurate perceptions uh, by China's leadership, drive their international behavior? Uh, for example, the East is rising, the West is declining. It seems to be an important driver of China's stance in international relations. I think that perceptions, of course matter greatly. And uh, I think the challenge is figuring out what the connection is between certain slogans, like the East is rising, the West is declining, uh, are between uh, there's a how, how accurate uh, reflection of their true perceptions uh, are these slogans. I say that because this slogan can also be interpreted as a statement of, of confidence, uh, an effort to project confidence uh, and encourage those within the party and within China to uh, continue to have faith in the CCP's leadership. So it is, I'm not sure that it is entirely um, an accurate assessment of uh, their perceptions. Um, so that this might also um, fall into the category of, of bluster. It's also unclear over what time scale uh, this perception extends. Um, I think that academics in China that I have talked with um, think that it's important that a, one appends to this slogan um, that the East is weak and the West is strong. And so if the East is rising, but from a very weak position, uh, it, it, it may not have um, the kind of connotation, I think, of, of hubris uh, that many in the in the I think outside of China have interpreted it. 
That said, I think there's certainly something here about uh, kind of the structural transitions and the shape of and distribution of, of power um, where China is rising, right? Um, now the question is, is the West declining? And uh, that has also, I think, been the subject of some debate uh, inside China with many uh, Chinese academic, well, well-regarded uh, experts and, and policy analysts noting all the many ways in which uh, you know China remains uh, decades behind, um, generations behind in important areas, not just technological, but also in terms of the university uh, education system, et cetera. Um, there's a whole list that, that some scholars have gone through. So, uh, you know, of course, I think perceptions do matter. And I think that the wh whether or not, um, I mean, I think there's little question that the uh, Trump administration's uh, pullback from international institutions and repudiation of alliances certainly, I think, affected uh, the belief in China um, that the um, the U.S. kind of commitment to global leadership had been uh, was unshakable. And I think nobody, including uh, many of our allies and partners around the world, um, were immune to those changes. And, and so, so perceptions matter. Um, but I don't think that they are entirely uh, misperceptions. So there is a, a, but I think it's it's difficult to know um, from the outside, and I think it's important to take with a grain of salt those who interpret some of these slogans as, uh, you know, unequivocal evidence of the leadership's perceptions. We have two more questions. Um, maybe I'll start with three. I'd start with the, the broader one, I think, from uh, Bloomberg, uh, Joe Xiao, who was wondering if you see the toning down in U.S.-China tensions since California as a sustainable or more of a temporary cooperation. Thank you for that. It's a great question. I see it as being um, uh, indicative of the Chinese government's desire for greater stability in the U.S.-China relationship not a kind of desire that leads them to want to make uh, a whole bunch of concessions, but nonetheless uh, consistent with the, basically, I think, the preoccupation with a lot of the domestic challenges that the government faces in its economy and the, uh, the lack of a desire uh, to take on any additional uh, risks. I think fundamentally, I think that they are um, interested in exploring uh, to what extent the relationship can be stabilized um, and that um, the, the, the direction that eyes were heading was not beneficial uh, to, to China's objectives. And so I think that there's a, a kind of a let, try it out. Um, and hmm, I think that the, certainly I think there's also an effort underway uh, to to try to appeal to uh, aspects of American society that have been uh, that might ex exercise a somewhat of a restraining effect on the kind of no holds barred uh, approach uh, that some have been advocating, and so um, you know that that those aren't uh, I think that that's also part of that that effort. So we'll see how long that lasts, and I think it's I don't think it's um, I think it would be premature to call it temporary. I think something that is temporary can become durable if if it's allowed to, um, if it's sort of reciprocated, I should say. And so I think there's a real uh, interest in, in, I've heard from Chinese interlocutors uh, to see reciprocal actions by the United States. Um, and, and so we'll see where that goes. You know, there was a more specific question um, 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 where um, uh, somebody is highlighting that, according to reports, uh, China is setting up quasi overseas police stations um, to not provide consular services, but also to intimidate uh, Chinese overseas. Uh, based on your research, uh, what underpins China's action in this uh, area and how uh, grow, uh, how should you? Uh, countries uh, respond. Thanks. I mean, this is an area of active, I think, development, and we need a lot more kind of research into what what is going on beyond the few kind of press reports that have documented. And of course, they've become politi 
kind of sensationalized as well as a target. So, um, you know, obviously the Chinese government should not be doing things that, uh, you know, flout the rule of law in, in dem democratic countries. Um, and but I think it does remain to be seen how directly coordinated these were um, by uh, Beijing as part of a kind of comprehensive strategy. Um, there are some reports that these are, uh, you know, of course, there are many actors within that system. And so it is difficult uh, to know. Um, but of course, I think that there is likely, given the response that they have met with, I think it would be uh, certainly a prudent uh, and I would I would not be surprised if the the Chinese government changed tactics as, as a result of this this strong pushback, um, which is I think in some cases uh, quite appropriate. Yeah, another question, um, and given the um, presidential elections in the U.S. this year, um, can you comment on more on the perception of China in the U.S.? It appears that there is a bipartisan agreement on China. But recent diplomatic efforts suggest that there is developing a more nuanced approach. Uh, how do you see it? And uh, what is your sense of where the U.S. will go in a second Biden or uh, a second Trump administration? So I think that there is, I think beneath the so-called bipartisan consensus on China, there's actually, it's quite thin. And I think that there's a lot of disagreement about the right um, response. Um, of course, you do have some bipartisanship in the House Select Committee on the CCP, um, but there are many things that, that the majority uh, does there that aren't necessarily supported by the minority, and then in which case it doesn't come out uh, together. I would also say that uh, even uh, on the Republican side of the aisle, I think there's been uh, a fair amount of um, I don't think support for the kind of clear-eyed communication that the Biden administration has sought to resume, um, and has resumed, I think, fairly successfully. I think that there's a lot more skepticism in the Republican side of the aisle as to what this is accomplishing. And of course, you had some quite charged op-eds by, uh, particularly, uh, the Mike, Representative Mike Gallagher um, on this being, you know, the equivalent of, of showing weakness and. Con making concessions, which there's no evidence thereof. If, if anything, the inflexibility on the U.S. side, I think, is likely to constrain what these uh, communication channels might ultimately produce. Um, although I think on fentanyl, which is, I think, of great interest to both parties, so that that's an area where reciprocal steps have been taken. And I think that uh, building on that, uh, we can see that when there is traction, these kinds of uh, diplomatic efforts can be meaningful um, and and worth pursuing, uh, and, and so I would say that there is, uh, you know, some surveys have recently suggested that um, you know the vast majority of Americans prefer kind of a smart and tough diplomacy, um, and that nobody there's little uh, support for a confrontational or aggressive American approach uh, to China still less support for any kind of conflict with China. So uh, I think it really depends too on what you ask and how you ask it. And I think it's very difficult to predict where the United States would go in a second Trump administration. Um, I think that the, there's been a lot of, although nonetheless you can see a, a fair amount of, of continuity on certain issues like technology. Um, and uh, you know I think that there will be much larger differences on in issues, say Taiwan. Yeah, and, and another one, somebody is arguing and score um, that China in 2023 is not much different from 2013, uh, but its relationship with the West is different, in particular the U.S. Um, what made the difference and how do you factor um, basically the change in the U.S. Uh, into your analysis? Well, I think that there's a lot riding on the word vastly there, because, of course, I think many would argue that China in 2023 is very different, maybe not vastly, but is quite different um, from 2013. And uh, many in the United States would attribute uh, the downturn in relations to China's actions that post-date 2013, including the military reclamation and militarization of outposts in the South China Sea, the you know continued border skirmishes with India on their border, the, you know, the crackdown in Hong Kong, I mean, the list can go on and on, right? So um, that said, I think the United States is also 
undergone a number of uh, changes. And so I think that both are really important. This is uh, the, the, the trajectory, the sharp downturn and all the fragile stabilization of US-China ties cannot be attributed to only one party. In fact, I think that they are very much actually in a kind of, had been and I think remain in sort of a, a, a spiral of, of action and reaction that is, I think, quite dangerous. Um, fed in part by changes domestically that have uh, both created, I think, greater cause for uh, suspicion and uh, distrust between the two, um, as well as, I think, changes in the kind of domestic appetite uh, for international leadership, different expectations domestically for what each government will be doing on the international stage. Um, and then one question is um, is related to whether the rest of the CCP leadership is aligned with um, what Xi Jinping is doing on the international stage. Um, are party goals not being challenged at all? Well, it's very difficult to know. Um, there are certainly have been individual voices that are not within the CCP leadership, but are not still connected to the party and the state apparatus that have, you know, suggested concerns about the value of uh, China's close partnership with Russia, for example, um, and others who have, you know, quietly, of course, this has all been done delicately, uh, suggested that the kind of securitization of everything is to the detriment of China's continued economic development. And so I think that there is, a, I, I think, a quite a significant amount of a skepticism. Um, but it's a time of great, I, I would say, fear and uh, growing constriction of um, space for policy discussion inside China. So the, whether or not, so there's, I think there's, a, there's, the apparent alignment may not reflect the true alignment, um, but that doesn't mean that they will be necessarily challenged either. I mean, I think that I don't go so far as some to say that Xi Jinping is solely surrounded by yes men and is unable to get uh, accurate information, or at least bad news, I think, is still reaching Xi Jinping. Otherwise, we would not be seeing some of the changes that we have seen, both in China's overall a diplomacy or its reaction to, for example, the stock market jitters, right? So there is some degree of a kind of uh, feedback and response taking place there. I wouldn't say that this is at the level of the overarching goals of the party, um, but in terms of performance and, and what constitutes good performance and what are some of the challenges, I still think that there is uh, some, some, some degree of input, I think, that is continuing to be taken in um, from from reality, um, but there I think remain challenges. I hear you know that those who are who who might be in a position to make the kind of changes needed may not feel that they have the authority to do so, um, you know, given the political structure and incentives at present. And we have um, an econ question: um, How China's short and long term economic difficulties might influence its foreign policy, especially uh, as it relates to Taiwan. So I think that the there's a couple of ways in this which this could play in. I think short term, I mean, Taiwan has always been a very challenging military target. And I don't think that uh, China's economic difficulties make it any more likely. I think it, it remains, a, it, it was already, a, would be a big gamble to to uh, try to invade. And I think that it's, these economic difficulties means that it's probably not at the top of uh, the priority list or doesn't, isn't something that I think uh, you know, Xi Jinping is likely to wake up thinking, okay, this is this, you know, this is the thing that he needs to solve. But of course, um, at a time when China faces a number of economic difficulties, he also can't afford to look weak. And so it really there is a maybe an increased sensitivity to foreign challenges, but that is not the same as um, providing a kind of pretext for some kind of diversionary uh, adventure. Uh, if anything, and I wrote about this in Foreign Affairs, because I thought that the level of speculation about uh, economic downturn and diminishing prospects leading to adventurism over Taiwan was getting out of hand and was dangerous. 
if anything, the research in international relations suggests that there's not that tight connection between domestic economic difficulties and aggression. And in the Chinese case, especially, um, there, if anything, the relationship runs in the opposite direction. When China's leaders face economic difficulties, they have tended to be more temperate uh, on the international stage. Then there is maybe more of a comment and uh, making the case for your book uh, being published soon, um, where um, uh, Bernard Young is basically saying what I hear, what, what I hear, what you have said also describes uh, the political and economic decision making and actions in the United States. So it's not monolithic. Um, both sides involve uh, blame narratives and self proclaimed legitimacy. Uh, the result is intensified tensions. Um, you know, what is the role of political scientists in this? And um, I think it's a very helpful question, but uh, more of a comment, but maybe you want to elaborate on that. I mean, I think ideally uh, experts who see the diversity of views in both countries, uh, I think can be helpful in pushing back against some of the fatalism that suggests that the future is written and that uh, there's no um, you know, possibility of, of change in either side's policies or orientation. Because I think that the, the, these spirals can become self-reinforcing. But as I said, in some cases, I think the, there are other voices and other views which may have been uh, you know, temporarily or kind of crowded out or, or marginalized, but are nonetheless, I think, as the dangers of a kind of showdown and the breakdown of paralysis of the international system become more apparent, I think there has actually become, been a, a shift, at least in the United States, uh, toward recognizing that some kind of uneasy uh, kind of cohabitation of the planet is, is going to be necessary uh, and that, though, that a war, all out war, would be catastrophic and decoupling is uh, impractical. So, um, you know, I think that the, I mean, Academics tend to enjoy uh, diving into the, the nuances, but I hope that some of that um, can surface. I think, uh, Alfred, you said it very well, which is that the conversations too easily become um, more and more black and white, and that's uh, to nobody's uh, benefit, um, except perhaps politicians seeking election. Um, but that's not the that's not the role of, of experts and scholars. And so hopefully that too can um, uh, play a role in the public debate. Then I think there's another question, I think not surprisingly on, on Taiwan, uh, since it has become an international concern, uh, but of course uh, is a core issue that underpins the legitimacy of uh, the party. Um, uh, do you want to comment a little bit more on that? Absolutely. Uh, and this is an area where I think that the fundamental goal here of um, you know, so-called uh, reunification is not likely to shift uh, under any kind of uh, kind of constellation of, of leadership in 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 China. But the way in which that objective is pursued and under what on what timeline, um, I think, is very much subject to to contestation. And so, so far, at least, peaceful so-called peaceful reunification, although that in includes. Um, some measures of coercion that don't extend to the use of force. That so far remains the the party line, and and I think we should we should hope that that remains the case. Uh, I think the real concern is that if that um, pathway, uh, the, the so-called peaceful pathway, looks uh, to be either permanently obstructed or altogether um, cut off that that might be the occasion on which uh, the party feels uh, you know, no, no alternative um, but to, to launch a, a war. Um, that's you know, one of the reasons why I and Bonnie Glazer and Tom Christensen have uh, urged recently in the latest issue of Foreign Affairs to ensure that deterrent threats are also paired with assurances uh, that these efforts to help strengthen Taiwan's self-defense to uh, better distribute the U.S. posture in the Asia Pacific. Um, that those are not intended at uh, permanently wresting the island away uh, from China and um, or or restoring uh, a permanent uh, 
formal uh, a military alliance with the IMF, because that uh, would be the kind of uh, development I think that would make that possibility um, you know no longer possible to sustain. Yeah, maybe I could um, just um, ask one question because you very much also talk about the slogans. Um, and I think this is sort of like room for misunderstanding, especially in the West. Um, China frequently operates in um, um, uh, coming up with slogans <clears throat> uh, in order to shape uh, um, thinking and change directions. Um, you know, often one gets the sense uh, that when the slogan is articulated, the good news is everybody can rally around the slogan, but it's not really understood what it means, or at least uh, everybody interprets it uh, very differently. While in the West, often it is assumed that this now uh, is the line of direction that has been clearly uh, determined what it means. How, how do these slogans ultimately um, help or hurt um, China in its relation to the West? Mm -hmm. Slogans are, I think, a double-edged sword. I mean, I think that they are, of course, uh, all leaders and parties, and governments communicate through words to organize and uh, discipline their systems to get folks on the same page. But they are frequently misunderstood and um, are often chosen not so much for what they convey to external audiences, um, but what they, how they make the how they convey domestic to domestic audiences what the government is about and how that's consistent with their values. So um, China is, I think, no exception to this. Um, and so words like, uh, you know, dare to struggle and be good at fighting, um, of course, then, you know, is very much interpreted and I think not inappropriately as, uh, as an effort to, to showcase resolve um, and to not be pushed around. But it, of course, is when accompanied with and, and, and practiced by Chinese diplomats in this very browbeating kind of way, um, one that tries to amplify others' um, kind of failures, um, is a very unlovable um, image, uh, this wolf warrior image. Um, I think there's been an interesting, some have commented that, well, and in fact, I think it was actually... Um, Liu Denchao in his recent visits described, somebody asked him about the wolf warrior, was this no longer? And he described the struggle as, uh, you know, really about, uh, you know, trying to, um, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, Chinese diplomats, you know, do their best, <laughs> which is a very different uh, kind of, uh, has a very different connotation. Um, and so I think struggle in particular is a term that translates poorly. Um, and and so I would say that this kind of language that is not readily understood is, I think, a real hindrance. Um, but nonetheless, it doesn't necessarily stop uh, government uh, leaders from China or really any other party um, from from continuing to uh, embrace their preferred slogans. Maybe um, I could ask one more one more question. You also highlighted. Uh, the difficulties in uh, implementing um, central decisions um, through the local governments uh, and at the local level, um, given the differences in incentive structures. Um, um, could you uh, elaborate a little bit more on this? Because uh, one gets the incentive that uh, the leadership wants it both. On the one hand, it wants uh, local uh, governments uh, to, of course, implement the latest uh, direction, um, but local governments are uh, given the insurmountable task of pursuing multiple objectives. Uh, so for example, in the economic sphere, on the one hand, you're supposed to uh, deliver growth, social stability, but then at the same time, you need to deal with overcapacity, uh, debt levels, problems in the real estate sector. So if you're a local government official, you literally have to uh, uh, figure out what is uh, the most important one. Um, have you focused a little bit on that? 
I have focused less on that, but I agree that your characterization is very apt. Um, and then in fact that this uh, confusion over prioritization where it had been, I think, clearer in years past that growth was the, no no instability, of course, but then growth was the an important determinant of how well you did. Um, now there's a lot of confusion as to which of these targets is the most important, which are soft, which are hard. Um, and I think it's leading to a lot of confusion and in some instance, um, paralysis of, in decision making as leaders don't at the local level don't really know what to do. No, well, thank you very much. Um, um, you know, if there are uh, any additional questions, please feel free to put it in the chat box. Do we already know when the book is likely to be published? That's always difficult uh, to predict ahead of time, but if you had a date, uh, maybe you could um, indicate that as well, because I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in um, in, in buying it and um, looking into some of the stuff more carefully. Well, I hope to have an update soon. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a date to announce yet, but thank you. Okay. It's really been a pleasure to join you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, sorry, we, we had to do it um, online. We hope to see you here. Uh, in Singapore at the university and at the institute uh, in the future. And we're also looking forward to uh, potentially uh, collaborate with you uh, in the future. Thank you very much for um, your excellent presentation. As I indicated at the very beginning, uh, we need more of that. And I think uh, some of the audience uh, echoed that, especially at this time, because the risk is too high that uh, uh, misinterpretation, misunderstanding can uh, make things a lot uh, worse. So thank you very much. And to you, uh, almost good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful day, everybody.